All right, tonight we have yet another story about the perks Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas accepted and did not disclose from his billionaire buddy Harlan Crow. ProPublica uncovered the evidence showing that Crow paid for Thomas's grandnephew to attend private boarding schools to the tune of potentially $150,000. Now, Clarence Thomas and his wife Ginny had custody of their grandnephew Mark Martin since he was six years old. According to Thomas, they raised him as a son. At Harlan Crow's recommendation, the Thomases sent Martin to Crow's alma mater for high school, Randolph-Macon Academy in Georgia, a military boarding school where Crow's name is on a classroom building. He also donated this bronze sculpture of the Air Force Honor Guard, bringing Clarence, Clarence Thomas along for his 2007 dedication. And of course, Crow footed the bill for Martin's tuition, running between twenty-five dollars and $30,000 a year at the time. When Martin transferred to a completely different boarding school in his junior year, Harlan Crow still paid $6,200 a month, as you can see on this bank statement. Now, that is certainly a nice thing to do for a young man from an underprivileged background and the family supporting him. But of course, the Thomases are not just any family. Clarence Thomas, as a justice on the highest court of the land, is required by law to disclose most gifts. And in fact, Thomas did disclose an earlier gift for his grandnephew's education. In 2002, Thomas reported receiving $5,000 from another friend, Earl Dixon. But he somehow never disclosed any of the tuition payments made by the Crows just a few years later. For his part, Harlan Crow is defending his actions. His office released a statement saying in part, quote, Harlan Crow has long been passionate about the importance of quality education and giving back to those less fortunate, especially at-risk youth. A friend of Justice Thomas also released a long statement on the matter, arguing it is a, quote, malicious story, shows nothing except for the fact that Thomases and Crows are kind, generous, and loving people who tried to help this young man. The statement also confirms that Harlan Crow did pay for Martin's first year at Randolph-Macon Academy and a year at his other boarding school in Georgia. I should note, the friend who wrote that long statement is the man depicted in the center of this painting. <laughs> Harlan Crow far right, commissioned this artwork to commemorate the time spent at his Adirondack Resort every summer with Justice Clarence Thomas, second from the right. Now, let's just take a step back for a moment, consider the nature of this relationship between Harlan Crow and Clarence Thomas. We call it a dear and deep friendship, and I am not a party to it, so I cannot say one way or the other, but I can say it sure seems like a strange kind of friendship. According to Crow, it is a friendship that began when the billionaire offered the justice, he was already a justice, a ride on his private jet. It is a friendship in which Crow regularly takes Thomas and his wife and the grandnephew they raised as a son on six-figure vacations around the world on his yacht. Crow also purchased the justice's mother's house, spent tens of thousands of dollars to fix it up, and allows her to live there to this day rent-free. And now we know that Crow also paid for the tuition of the adopted son of Clarence Thomas. There is a word for this kind of relationship in English. It is called a benefactor. Obviously, for someone who is supposed to be an independent arbiter of justice on the highest court in the land, having a benefactor raises some questions about your impartiality and your independence. Even Crow himself does not seem to deny the true nature of this relationship. In an oddly honest-seeming interview, Crow was asked, if he would still be friends with Thomas if Thomas was not a Supreme Court justice. Crow answered, quote, it's an interesting, good question. I don't know how to answer that. Maybe not. Maybe yes. I don't know. And when asked if he can ever considered their friendship to be a quid pro quo, Crow did not say no. Instead, he replied, quote, every single relationship, a baby's relationship to his mom, has some kind of reciprocity. I have to say, it's a little unclear just who is nursing at whose breast in this metaphor. Senator Peter Welch is a Democrat of Vermont. He serves on the Judiciary Committee, called for a code of conduct for Supreme Court justices in the committee's hearing on Tuesday, and he joins me now. Um, Senator, do you think uh, these payments should have been disclosed, and do you think they're appropriate? I think they should have been disclosed, and they're totally inappropriate. Uh, I mean, that was a really uh, damning introduction that you gave. You know, the Supreme Court used to be our most respected institution. Uh, 20 years ago, two-thirds of the American people looked up to it. Today, two-thirds of the people look down 
on, on it. And the loss of respect for the Supreme Court is really a threat to our democracy. We need a court that has the esteem and respect of the American people. So there's really two issues here. One is, you know, these extraordinary gifts that were given to uh, uh, Justice Thomas. Uh, they're really shocking. But the other shocking thing is the lack of a code of ethics in transparency in the Supreme Court. You know, Chris, we have about 850 judges at the district court and the appellate court level in the in the federal judiciary. All of them would have had to report every single one of those uh, gifts, except for nine. And those nine happen to be on the United States Supreme Court. So I am mystified that the chief justice, who has the custodial responsibility to do everything he can to enhance the reputation and respect for the court, won't step forward and have a code of conduct that applies to those 850 other uh, circuit and, uh, and appellate judges. Um, I want to bring another story to your attention because it just was published just before we came on air. Uh, it's a story about Leonard Leo. Now, if we, I don't know if we have the, the photo back from up in the, up in the script, the amazing painting, uh, if there's any way to put that on screen right now. But Leonard Leo's also in that painting. He is notoriously the sort of mastermind behind the entire Federalist Society right-wing judicial network that vets judges and puts them on the court. Um, we have a story about him directing Kellyanne Conway about 10 years ago. There he is uh, on the left right next to Short Sky. Uh, him directing Kellyanne Conway to give Ginny Thomas... $25,000 in payment through a nonprofit he was not on the board of. And he emphasized the paperwork should have no mention of Ginny, of course. This nonprofit would go on to pay her nearly $100,000, uh, none of it mentioning that it's to Ginny Thomas. We don't know if the other payments were hurt as well, though they did pay her firm. Uh, this does not seem great. What do you think about that? Well, I'd use the word deceit. I'd use the word cover-up. I'd use the word evasion. I mean, it's clear that Leonard Leo knew that if this saw the light of day, uh, it would cause controversy. And the bottom line here is that the court is getting itself in an immense amount of trouble, and that's bad for our democracy. Uh, you know, whatever the relationship is with Thomas uh, and his benefactor, uh, it's a pretty shocking thing to be getting vacations on yachts in Greece, in New Zealand, uh, to be flying on private jets and have that not be known. And obviously, the whole Federalist Society relationship is something that's extraordinarily important. It's been very discouraging. I'm on the Judiciary Committee now, as you know, but I've watched those Judiciary Committee hearings before, and when these nominees are put forward, the Judiciary Committee is an afterthought. The Federalist Society is the interview that really matters for those folks to get the imprimatur uh, for approval on the Republican side. And that has been a long-term concerted and unfortunately effective effort by Leonard Leo. And we have to have a Supreme Court in this country that people respect. It's really important. And anything that any one of those justices does that erodes the confidence that our people are all entitled to, that the decisions are on the level, is wrong. The chair of your uh, committee, Senator Dick Durbin of Illinois, has written several letters, I believe, to the chief justice. He's called on the chief justice to launch an investigation, to police the court more thoroughly. The chief justice rebuffed an invitation to come testify. Is that sufficient to put this on the chief justice? It, it absolutely it is, actually. I mean, first of all, if the chief justice doesn't act, we can't. And what I want to make clear is that when it comes to the judicial decisions, Congress has to stay out. The court has the authority to make those decisions, but Congress has other authority, and that includes uh, with respect to the judiciary and the executive, setting salaries, uh, setting ethical codes, uh, it, it, it's setting what jurisdiction is appropriate for the court. So there's a role that the, the legislative body plays in our system of uh, checks and balances. We can't get involved in judicial decisions, but we can't look the other way when there is conduct that is clearly eroding confidence well, in the judicial branch of our government. I don't know anything in particular, but just based on what we've seen in the last few weeks, my suspicion is that there will likely not be the end of this. We'll see. Senator Pierre Welch of Vermont, uh, come back anytime. Thank you very much.
Today in North Carolina, the Republican-controlled legislature approved a 12-week abortion ban that looks like it's going to become law. Up until last month, Republicans held majorities in both the State House and the Senate, but anything they passed could be vetoed by the Democratic Governor Roy Cooper. That is until a state representative named Trisha Cotham, who ran and won as a pro-choice Democrat in 2022, that's what she was elected as, in a sudden, startling, and at least partially unexplained move, flipped her party affiliation seemingly out of nowhere to become a Republican. She has said she felt too controlled by the Democratic Party. This is a woman who spoke movingly about her own abortion on the floor of the North Carolina State House in 2015 when she was arguing against abortion restrictions. She even co-sponsored a bill in January, four months ago, to codify abortion protections in her state. Yesterday, that same woman you see there cast the deciding vote in line with all other Republicans to approve a 12-week abortion ban and ensured that even if Governor Cooper vetoes the bill, which he has said he will, Republicans can override the veto and make the ban law. Jessica Valenti's work has been essential in tracking the story of abortion rights in the post royal era. She's the author of the newsletter Abortion Every Day, where today she published a story titled Texas is Fabricating Abortion Data. We'll talk about it in a second. And she joins me now. Um, Jess, I saw you also write about the North Carolina law saying it's even worse uh, than you think. Uh, what's your rundown, the basic takeaway of this law? Sure. They are trying very, very hard in North Carolina to make this bill come across as if it's a moderate bill. They're calling it things like common sense, uh, reasonable. One of the sponsors even said it's not an abortion ban. It's a pro-life plan because they know just how much Americans and voters in North Carolina don't want abortion to be restricted. I mean, so they're trying to make it seem like it's super moderate, super common sense, when in fact it's pretty old school. It's a very like old school punitive uh, abortion ban. It has mandates that make women look at ultrasounds, um, listen to fetal heartbeats while the doctor explains the, the ultrasound, like really sort of old school Republican stuff that is not moderate, not reasonable in the slightest. There's also this, um, this jumped out at me, and I don't know if you were the person, I think, who pulled this out or someone else did, but that the de definition of a woman, and woman, a female human, whether or not she is an adult, which, of course, just um, lets you know that some of the people who will be forced to carry pregnancies to term will be children under this law. Yeah, they are. I mean, there's a lot of language in the bill that makes it clear that they understand the kind of suffering that this bill is going to cause, right? They're talking about children, though they're saying in a, in a roundabout way, they're talking about um, fetal abnormalities, and um, talking about uh, providing women with palliative uh, consultations for the newborns that they're going to be forced to carry. Really, really dark stuff, honestly. Um, they have to also explain in writing orally or provide to the women all the following information. These are women that are before yeah. the 12-week ban who, 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 who uh, do want to get an abortion. While there exists a risk of stillbirth with life-limiting anomalies, life-limiting anomalies have resulted in live births of infants with unpredictable and variable lengths of life. This is part of the sort of like state-sanctioned propaganda that has to be directed to every woman actually obtaining an abortion before the cutoff. Yeah. And they have different rules for medication abortion, which they're trying to sneak by, too. Um, they are saying it's a 12 week ban for medication abortion. It's a 10 week ban. And they have things in terms of like the terrible things that doctors are being forced to tell patients. Um, doctors are forced to tell patients if you have a medication abortion, you may see the remains of your unborn child. That's their language. Again, really dark, really, really punitive. It's very, very cruel. Um, you had some reporting in your excellent substack today about Texas abortion data, where the, essentially you sort of uncovered just almost preposterously shoddy double counting and fabric and sort of outright fabrication of data around complications due to abortion. Explain the story. So essentially, conservatives are super desperate right now to prove that abortion is unsafe. But we know that abortion is incredibly safe. And so because they don't have the science on their side, they've sort of decided to make up statistics using this reporting law. So they are forcing doctors in Texas and the doctors that I've spoken to, by the way, 
are describing sobbing as they're filling out these forms. They are forcing doctors to fill out forms on a state website with their patients' private data, connecting their medical conditions to abortion complications, even when there is no connection whatsoever, right? They are doing anything that they can. And any doctor that this patient speaks to while they're at the hospital or while they're at their doctor's office has to report as well. And so one patient who may not even have a complication at all is all of a sudden responsible for three or four complication reports that they will then use in an annual um, abortion complication report to prove that abortion is dangerous. Yeah, I'm just reading from your reporting. Sue, a, a pseudonym for emergency medicine physician and other Texas doctors, have been required to submit patients' private medical information to state-run website without their knowledge or consent, adhering to a mandate that forces them to report women as suffering from abortion complications even when they're not. A rarely reported on section of Texas law lists 28 medical issues as abortion complications. Doctors are required to tell the state about any woman who developed one of these issues if she happens to have had an abortion at any point in her life, meaning they don't actually have to be connected to the abortion. They're used to pad these stats. Jessica Valenti, whose substack uh, is uh, vital during these times. Thanks so much for coming on.